Tom Campbell here. If you find something of significant value in our videos, please consider supporting their production through our Patreon account or through a one-time donation. The links are in the description below. Thank you and enjoy the video. Well, now we are going to talk about communicating with other IUOCs and with the larger consciousness system. Okay. So you notice we're, we're leaping two days in a single bound here in one, one evening, and we're going to continue to do that. So communicating, that's called telepathy, when you communicate in a manner other than with voice or body language or books and ink and that sort of thing. So this communication can take place between IUOCs. Now, an IUOC could be somebody who has been here and died. It could be somebody who's never been here, or it could be somebody who is here and perfectly alive, maybe just in the other room. IUOCs are all of those things, and you can communicate to those. Besides that, an IUOC might be your dog or your cat or your horse, or the squirrel that stands up on your back porch. Also, a consciousness. Anything that's conscious is, falls under the heading of an IUOC, an individuated unit of consciousness. So you can communicate with anything that's conscious. Conscious to conscious communications. This is done in an intuitive space, and it's done, as all these things are done, with intent. You must have an intent to make the communication. It's just as simple as that, really. You just have an intention to communicate, just start the communications. and. Let happen whatever happens. Again, if your intellect jumps in front and wants to know, who is that speaking? Did I just make that up? Is that my imagination? Or am I really speaking to somebody? And how do I know it's really Uncle Fred? And you have all these issues that the intellect wants to know that will pull you out of the intuitive space and will kind of end the conversation. So just experience it. Ask your questions, or you don't, you don't have to be in question mode. You also can be in, in telling mode. You know, it's mostly you're a listener, but you can also, you know, it's a backward and forth. It's a conversation that you can have. You can also communicate with the larger consciousness system and it with you. Matter of fact, your guides, if you have guides, if you're aware of having guides, these guides are just your personal interface to the larger consciousness system. That is you talking to the larger consciousness system, but not some impersonal system. You get a personal interface, somebody with a sense of humor, somebody, you know, with a, a face, if you get to, to see your guides, someone who is male or female, someone who has a who represents a metaphor that you would find credible. So if you happen to be a Christian, then you may be talking to saints or maybe to Mary or maybe to Jesus or somebody of that sort, angels perhaps. If you are living in the eastern part of our world, at least what we call eastern anyway, I guess that's a pretty relative term. What we call Eastern, it may be your ancestors that you're talking to. Or maybe it's a guru. Or maybe it's just this person who seems to know a whole lot more about things than I do. But you, your guide will be an interface kind of hand-selected to interact with you. Maybe male, maybe female, maybe neuter. May not be either strongly male or female. 
or you have, may have more than one guide. The system decides what venue or what uh, personality would work best in getting information to you. So that's typically what your guide is. So you communicate with your guides telepathically. Telepathic communications are not in terms of letters and words and sentences. They're in terms of whole paragraphs, sometimes whole chapters. Just suddenly, you know the answer. You, you just know the information. And as you ask for details, you get detailed information. So it's not just general information, but you can get very detailed information. And it just comes to you. A second ago, you didn't know that. Now you do. You didn't read anything. You didn't hear anything. It's just a mind-to-mind -mind transfer of information. You, till, you still take that information in and interpret it in terms of your own, what do I say, your own history, your own database. You interpret it in terms of your own fears, your own caring, your own love, your own ego, your beliefs. All those things color your interpretation of the information you get, whether it's you know, information you read in a book that's physical or whether you're speaking to somebody or whether you get it intuitively. You still have to interpret it. So what you... Interpret is not necessarily what you got. It's what you think you got. It's how you interpret what you got. Now, if the things that you get are things that are familiar to you, then your interpretation is probably going to be pretty accurate. As the things that you get are not familiar to you, there's something far out that you've never experienced before, then your... your uh, your coloration is going to be more likely to affect your results. You will never know for sure how much of what you got was your coloration. It comes from your, again, your fears and your beliefs and, and your love and your caring and your knowledge and also your ignorance. You know, all of those things, how much of it comes from what you add to it, and how much is what you got originally. You won't know that. You can't know that absolutely. You'll never know absolutely. But with experience, you will come to the point that you're pretty sure. With experience, you'll feel like you're 99.9% .9 sure where that came from. Initially, when you don't have a lot of experience, you'll have no idea. It just came. So particularly in the beginning, trying to ask or get an answer to the question, who was that really? Who am I talking to? Because you are also an IUOC. So your imagination is another source. You see, so there's three sources there if you'd like to single yourself out a special from the class of IUOCs. It's you, every other IUOC, dead or alive, here or there, and the larger consciousness system. And it could come from any of those. As a beginner, don't worry too much about vetting the source. It's something we do with our intellect right away, but... Try to let that slide. Just experience. With experience, you'll be able to answer the more important question, which is, does it matter? Is it important? What am I learning? What's the value here? And be aware that the value may not be in the information itself. The value may be in you practicing the process of getting the information. You may find out the information itself is neither here nor there, not that important. But the process you've been going through 
to collect that information and develop those intuitive channels, that may be very important. So when you look about, when you, when you start to do the, is it valuable? That is it valuable is a very broad question. Not just about the information itself, but about the whole process and every way that it interacts with you. And mostly about what you're learning, how you're growing, how it adds to your experience base in a positive way. That's an important part of that evaluation. So all the same, all the same rules apply. This only works from an intuitive space. You have to just be and let it come. You can't force it. Your intellect will get in the way. So you should think for a few minutes about uh, also of why you want to communicate. That's an important part of it. What is the purpose of this communication? It's a very important part of it. If the purpose is negative, negative to neutral, then it's not a good thing to do. Negative would be, let's say you want to manipulate someone. You would like your child to clean up their room. So you're going to make a, a conscious to consciousness connection and you're going to say, clean up your room. You must clean up your room. Before you leave your room, clean it up, you know, and you just keep saying this to your, you know, what's your 13 year old. And that is not a good use of these skills to manipulate, to get someone to do what you want, even if, well, it's what I want, but it's only for their own good. No, you can't classify that as thinking about other. You must classify that as thinking about you. Okay. So that's very important is why. This needs to be done with caring. It needs to be done with love. It needs to be about other. And then it will work better and the result will be positive. If you're manipulating, you may actually get your way in that manipulation, but you will also create mistrust in that individual because they will know that they were manipulated and they will know you manipulated them and they will resent that at a deeper level. So yes, you can manipulate other people, but there's a price to pay for that that usually is much higher than what you think you're going to get out of it. So generally don't go there. You need to do this truly for uh, non-manipulative reasons, okay. for caring reasons. All right, well, that's about all I need to tell you about communication. That was very short. Um, it's, it's one of the easier things to do because you just have to open and listen. Now, again, you can talk. So if you want to talk to someone, you can speak to them. They can speak to you. It's like a conversation. But remember, it's not, it's a conversation in your mind and if the conversation is, has a lot of feeling tones to it, it'll be a lot more successful than if it's intellectual. If you're going to, you know, explain to them exactly how many angels can dance on the head of a pin, it probably isn't going to work very well. That's all intellect. But if it's something you're trying to be helpful, trying to tell them that they are valuable, they are worthwhile, they are loved, and you're trying to get that across, well, get it across with feelings much more effectively than you get it across with words. The words are just there to support the feelings. This is a great tool to use when the face-to-face -face encounter would be problematical. 
Sometimes it's just hard to get face to face, particularly with those people we care about and care about us. And it's difficult. I started the conversation talking about manipulating a teenager. Teenagers are in that group of people that are sometimes hard to talk to. Okay. But so are in-laws and neighbors and spouses and relatives and people at work. There's a lot of people that are in that group that are really difficult. It's problematic to talk to them face to face. Well, when you connect with them, conscious to consciousness, all of that water under the bridge stuff that makes it difficult isn't there. You just talk with them. And they will get it. They will hear it. It will make an effect on them. They may reject what you say. You have to allow that. That's okay. You're not here to win an argument. You're here just to impart some love, and some information, or you know, just connect with people, maybe people you haven't seen for a long time. Okay, so this is uh, communicating with IUOCs and the larger conscious system. I'd just like to open up to that Q&A so you can get your questions answered. And if we run out of questions here, we'll go back and talk about accessing uh, and holding point consciousness. So we can do both. But let's try to stay on subject first until we kind of run out of that subject. All right. Oh, hey. Please go ahead. This is it's going back to what we were talking about before, but it's it's actually relative to the to the to the topic right now, which is about uh, making contact and 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 because uh, when you were saying before how uh, like um, uh, how to initiate the contact, and I, I'm finding that very very hard to do. I'm I'm assuming that that's something that uh, as we grow into this, as when when we can. But for now, all, all I've done is uh, I've. I've been contacted from the other side kind of thing. Like I, have, I haven't been able to, uh, even though I've had the intent, I've, I haven't been able to, to, to make the contact myself. I, I always have to sort of like wait for it to come to me. Uh, but I'm assuming that's, that's normal? Yes, it is. But I can give you a technique to get over that, to get around that problem. The reason that making the contact is difficult is because in the process of making the contact, your intellect gets ready to assess the data as it comes in. All right, I'm going to make a contact. I'm going to talk about these kinds of things. And your intellect is just sitting right up here on your shoulder, just, just waiting for the answer. And that's what gets in the way. So it's hard to initiate and leave the intellect behind. That's the difficult part. So, the best thing to do is lead with your imagination. Don't worry about the contact, because otherwise the intellect is saying, yeah, contact, right? You're going to talk to your dead uncle, right? Uh-huh. All right, let's see how this works out. You know, that's the way your intellect is, is acting, and that's not helpful. So, just start out talking to that uncle. Start the conversation. Hello, Uncle Fred. Yeah. I've been wanting to talk to you. Here's what I want to talk to you about. La da 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 da. Use your imagination. That starts the conversation and gets you over the breaking the ice problem without your intellect involved. Keep it in your imagination such that you lose sight of the fact that it is your imagination. You know how you get in a daydream. And after a while, that daydream just kind of has a life of its own. And you're in that daydream and you're interacting and you're doing things and so on. And you're not really thinking so much. It's a daydream. You kind of forget that you're daydreaming because you're so absorbed with the daydream. That's the way you need to get here with your imagination. You need to start the conversation and get absorbed in it. So all you really need is just a few, a couple of starting lines and maybe a couple of replies. And after that, Ask something that's interesting enough for you to really get interested in it. And don't think, oh, this is my imagination. Oh, I just wanted to remind you, 
this is my imagination, you know, try to let that part of you go and to start the conversation with the idea that you are going to talk with your deceased Uncle Fred. So you start that conversation and sure enough, as soon as you let go of that intellectual inspection of what's going on, you'll start talking with your Uncle Fred. The system will take over that daydream. It'll take over that imagination and start feeding you data. One will seamlessly go into the other, and you won't even know that it's happened until later when Uncle Fred tells you things that just aren't in your imagination. So mm -hmm. that's the best way to get over it, is to, to start the conversation. And eventually, that gets to where that start only lasts the first five seconds and you immediately just get right into it. That becomes e easier. Initially, it's a little harder to get mm -hmm. that intellect to, to sit down and be quiet, but that's the way you get it around. See, that's an end run. Start with the conversation. So the ice is already broken. Get involved in the discussion to the point that you're not really paying much attention to the details. In other words, your intellect now is sitting down being quiet because you're not doing something amazing like talking to a dead person. And then when it's no longer amazing and your intellect is sitting down a little bit, then just go on with it and let it go wherever it goes. And pretty soon you're talking to your Uncle Fred. Okay, so that's the way that works. Now, when you talk to people who, are, who were here and alive and, and were deceased, that happens in a couple of ways. You can just get data out of the database. Okay, everything that was Uncle Fred in the database is exactly Uncle Fred, except there's no free will there. But let's say the kind of questions you want to talk about, he needs free will to talk about them. You're going to talk about the election you know, we just had or something coming up in your future or whether or not buying a bicycle for your, you know, your niece was really a good idea. You're worried maybe she'll get hurt on it and should have you done, you should have done that, you know. You're going to be talking about things that are all current events long past after Uncle Fred did. It's not in his database as to how to respond to that. So then the larger consciousness system will provide the free will, but it will be bound by Uncle Fred's database. In other words, it'll only say those things that Uncle Fred was highly likely to have said. It looks at the probability and it will give you information that is current, couldn't be in the database, but it's still true to that character according to the what is in the database. Now, you know, why would the LCS go to all that trouble? It goes to all that trouble because mostly when you talk to dead people, it's not about the dead person. It's about you. Your need to talk to that dead person is about you and your growth. Or maybe it's even you just gathering information. You want to ask Uncle Fred some things about him and Aunt Susie, and Aunt Susie's still alive, so you can go check them with Aunt Susie and see whether you really talk to Uncle Fred. You see, maybe it's just that. But it's about you. It's not really about Uncle Fred. And the system supports that because the system supports your growth. And you're obviously a seeker. Or you wouldn't be trying to talk to your dead uncle. So the system supports it. As you grow up, it gets a little entropy, you know, reduction itself because you're a part of it. So it supports it just like it supports you doing other things. So the system is there for people who are seeking, who are trying, and who are part of the solution. And you solving issues you might have with your uncle, even if that issue is data collection, then the system will support that, just like it supports any of the rest of the things you do that are, that are growing. So that's why the system supports it. Now, will you be able to tell that this is data from a database? No. It will appear to you exactly like Uncle Fred. It'll have all his mannerisms, all his knowledge, all his personality, everything about it. There will be no way for you to say, oh, that's the, 
that's the database Uncle Fred rather than that's the real Uncle Fred because they're both the same. That's the real Uncle Fred without free will attached. And as long as you're talking about past stuff, no free will is necessary. If you're asking to make choices in future data, then free will is necessary and the system will step in to do that. So there's no way to really tell the difference. It is 100% uh, Uncle Fred. Yeah. So to try to question that doesn't help. So that's, that's one way to get around these, these starts. You just start with your imagination, start having that, ask the questions you need, see what happens, see what comes, or tell the things you need to say. And just let it flow. Let it go wherever it goes. That's the best way to start if breaking the ice is a difficult thing. Yeah, I think, I think in a way I've kind of managed to do that once, which is the, that was kind of like the breakthrough for me. When, uh, and it's exactly what, it's amazing, it's exactly what you're talking about, about uh, with, a, with a dead relative, which uh, just appeared to me. And I was shown an image of something that it didn't make any sense to me. Uh, but that same image, like it was actually something that happened to me the day after. And that was shown to me as in, they were showing me that to prove that 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 was the real contact that that was uh, that that was going to happen I, I it's, it's not something that i could have made up it's not something that that there was a probability of it happening it just happened yes well the system usually does that you know and it does that for you it does that for mediums you know marla here is a medium and she will she can uh, talk about this process but because the system is trying to do something for you to heal you it's necessary that you have a sense of its reality, that you have a sense of its authenticity. Yeah. So when you start a process, the first thing, one of the first few things that comes across is some little fact, some little thing that demonstrates to you that this is the real Uncle Fred. You know, this is, this is for real because they'll tell you something that is just evidential to you, call you by a nickname that nobody else knows, you know, or some kind of a thing. So the system I'd say when you talk with dead people, the system in the first 10% of the conversation is going to come across with something to give you credibility that this is real. Because if you don't think it's real, then it's, you're not going to learn anything. You're not going to, you know, bury the hatchet or whatever it is you've got with Uncle Fred or whatever the issues are. It's just not going to work for you if it's not real. So that's typical that, the, the, that it will give you something to verify the reality early on. Sometimes it may be at the end, but sometimes in the process, usually early on, that you'll get that, that verification. They'll tell you something that's just not inside your head. That's, that's how you know for, you know, that's how you get a good sense that you're, you're really connected is that when you get information that you don't know. Now, eventually, you'll get good at this, and you'll just tell by the feel of it whether it's right or not. You'll know what right information feels like. And we've got that connection, and it's who you want to connect. You don't have to wait for a, you know, them to tell you something amazing to, you know, to give you credibility or anything. You just know it, because as soon as the connection's made, it's obvious to you that you've got Uncle Fred on the line and what would you like to know about Uncle Fred? So eventually it gets like that. But in the beginning, it's not like that. In the beginning, you're unsure and you're tentative and you just need to practice a lot before you get to the point that you're comfortable with it. And once you're comfortable with it, it becomes easy and it becomes reliable and it becomes accurate which is an amazing thing that people need, you know, that people are astonished with is that the intuitive side, we think of the intuitive side as those, those gut guesses, you know, that gut feeling, go with your gut kind of thing. The intuitive side can be just as accurate and just as, um, can I say, uh, precise 
and just as reliable as the intellectual information. You just have to get good enough at dealing with it that you can hold those states in order to get that level of accuracy. So it just takes time for that. It'll get easier and easier the more you practice with it. If you don't practice with it, it never get any easier. <laughs> you get better at it with, with practice. Stephen, go ahead with your question. Um, thank you. Uh, so my question's around, so in your example, if Uncle Fred was still alive um, and you're communicating to him, what, what's his experience? Like, does, does he still recall the conversation or is it something that's just like a knowing at a, at a sort of a lower level or, or what's, what's the experience on their side? Okay. It depends on how aware they are. Um, their experience is going to be like your conversation, the things that you say, they will get as their own intuition. It'll come through their intuitive channel. Okay, so if they're intuitive and they listen to that intuition, then they may hear it word for word and be able to tell you exactly what you said and the language that you chose to say it. But most people aren't that in tuned. And most people, they just get that sense of that information coming to them. It'll be an intuitive thing. And if they don't know even that intuition is a thing that exists, they'll just think it's just, it's an idea that appeared in their mind. It's an idea that just came to them and they thought of it. Or they may not notice it at all. It stays beneath the level of their intellect. It goes right to the being level and it's part of that being level, but it's not part of their intellect, but it's still there. They still get the message, even if that message isn't intellectual. It may come across as a feeling. They may see it in terms of pictures when you gave it in terms of words. They may translate it. In other words, they still have to translate it, remember. They still have to interpret it. So they're going to interpret it in their own way. They may interpret it into metaphors as they go. And those would be the metaphors that they will see. So they will get it. Now, I have talked with people... Uh, telepathically, who got it word for word. They could tell me exactly what I had said. And I've talked to others that had no idea I'd ever talked to them, but they got the idea just the same. As I told them what I said and what the conversation was about, they'd go, oh yeah, I felt that. I had that idea. It just kind of came to me that, you know, that such and such and such, which is what I had told them. So that's what the person gets. It's just is something that kind of pops into their mind, a feeling they get. Again, feeling space is much richer than intellectual space in these conversations. So, sorry, just to clarify, so to give an example, if I've, I've found a lot in the past when I work with someone for a long, long time, you get to a point where you have the same thoughts or, or you have the same ideas and then they mm -hmm. appear at almost the same time. Um, yet I'm not trying to do this uh, and presumably they're not either. So is that, are we just like natively doing this or is that something completely different? That well, different we do say? natively do this. People do this all the time. If you think about somebody and your intention goes to that person, they get a little nudge. You've just communicated to them. We tell, we, you know, talk to each other telepathically all the time. So if you're around person a lot, which means you think of them a lot, they're in your mind a lot because you spend a lot of time and effort and you say work on the same projects or you sit next to each other in an office and you share a lot of stories. If you're around somebody a lot, like maybe you're, you're, you're significant other, you're around that significant other a lot, then you get to the point where you do, you are aware of each other's thoughts. You are very familiar with it. And matter of fact, when you started and first knew them, telepathy was probably a one hundredth of one percent of your total conversation. People you're really close to, it might be like 10 or 20 percent of your conversation might be telepathic. So yes, those kinds of things happen at all. I mean, how many times 
have you just thought of your old buddy that you haven't seen in 20 years to have the phone ring within another day or two? And there he is, he calls you up. And that's not just luck or circumstance. You got that thought because he was thinking about you and was intending to call you up. And you got that thought. And he just kind of pops into your mind and says, oh, yeah, I haven't thought about Joe for, for a long time. I wonder how he's doing. You know, and then two days later, Joe's on the phone. So when we think of other people, it's our intention that does this. And we do it organically without us trying to do it, just the thoughts. That's why people who are very, very close seem to know each other's minds. Matter of fact, if you get a, a team of people that you work very closely with, it gets to the point that the team members hardly have to actually speak to each other. They just know, you know what this one's going to do and how they're going to do it and what you need to do next to connect to that. And the team just works together almost with, with no conversation. Maybe little, little noises, little grunts, little body language here and there, and, and that's all you need. But when you were first together as a team, everything had to be spoken explicitly because you hadn't developed that closeness yet. You, you weren't in each other's minds so much. So yes, we do that all the time without thinking about it. Uh, it's part of the way we communicate. Thanks, Tom. That uh, clarifies a lot. Tola, please go ahead. Thank you. And Tom, thanks. You've answered a part of my, my question. Uh, so it's just a, a little bit more um, clarification that I'll probably ask you. And the part that you did answer was, I was going to ask how much emphasis can we actually put on these conversa conversations with IOCs that have transitioned if, like you say, you know, they've moved on and we'll mostly be talking to residual data, perhaps in their form. So thank you. You've answered that one. Um, the, the second part will probably be, isn't it then better? to just ask the LCS about future probability than asking their Uncle Fred if the LCS would, in effect, embody Uncle Fred mm -hmm. to answer that question, and it would still be limited in the frame of Uncle Fred's awareness or perception. Mm -hmm. Right, in okay. Effect, then go well, directly to the LCS to ask that question. Yeah, okay, the answer for that is, Whatever interface makes you feel most comfortable and enables you to work well intuitively, use that one. If talking directly to the LCS is something that is easy for you and it works well and you've got a good working relationship, then use that. If that isn't something that you've developed and you don't really have a good working relationship, but you really... Uncle Fred was just your favorite uncle and you and he were really close. Well, then you may find that Uncle Fred is a easier doorway to use. But yes, it doesn't really matter. You use, you use the, the tool. In that case, your Uncle Fred is just a tool for finding things out. And you use the tool that works best for you. So let's say you're a person and you feel like talking to the LCS is scary, you know, LCS, you know, it's big and whatever, and I'm just small, and it's kind of just a scary thing to go and talk into the LCS. Hey, LCS, you know, you expect to get slapped for impertinence just for calling them hey, you know, so if that's part of your feeling, then Uncle Fred's going to be easier because you know Uncle Fred, and you can say, hey, Uncle Fred, you know, and that works fine. You're more relaxed, therefore, you're more in the intuitive state. So whatever works for you, is fine. It can work. It can work either way. You know, but we, we need to pick something that is familiar, comfortable for us. Otherwise, if we're not comfortable, then our intellect jumps in to fix the problem and messes the whole thing up. So it has to be comfortable. You know, you don't find people who have two headed chickens as guides, or, uh, you know, the talking dogs as, uh, you know, is the way they reach the that's because these things are unnatural. You know, they don't feel right. They're not 
you're not relaxed with something like that. Who would believe, you know, what a two headed chicken would say, you know, it's not the right thing, but if uncle Fred, that's why I say you go to the East and ancestors are very important. Ancestors are very highly regarded. And a lot of your contact to the larger conscious system is through ancestors. They're your, they're your connection point. You work through ancestors. For us in the West, not so much. Our ancestors, uh, we don't have that same attitude toward them, so we don't, we don't use them as tools that way. You say, but you can. You, know, you can. So you know, some people, their only contact to the larger system is through their ancestors. You know? And for others, you just go direct, go to the LCS. You know, LCS is a metaphor as well. Larger conscious system is a metaphor for source. It's the source, but that's a metaphor as well. Now, if you're a computer guy and you think of a larger, you know, this, this large information system, well, that may be even more comfortable than your mother, you know, because you deal with large information systems all the time and that just fits really nice. But if talking to an information system is something that leaves you cold and prickly and not, uh, you know, that's just not too, too good for you, then, yeah, go talk to your Uncle Fred. Go, uh, you know, some other direction that works better. Thank you. Yeah, it just made sense, especially when I do hear you on some um, numerous YouTube clips when you talk describe the database and the, the information that's available there of course if i hadn't heard that my my own perception would have been limited to perhaps dead ancestors anyway but when you do explain it the way you do and me being a logical bound person to an extent yeah it made a lot of sense yeah thank you tom campbell here I and MBT Events hope you liked this video. We now have well over a thousand hours of free video on this user-friendly, ad-free YouTube channel. Though these videos are free to our viewers, they represent many thousands of hours in production and editing, and many thousands of dollars invested in video and audio equipment, along with the required computers and software to store and process the raw video into finished products. So far, all of this content has been funded directly out of our own pockets. Be assured, we will always continue to do what we can. It's our life, our purpose, a labor of love that we will continue to pursue as best we can. However, those pockets are not as deep as they used to be. Thus, we are now seeking to augment our resources with support from our viewers. If you find something of significant value in our videos, please consider supporting their production through our newly created Patreon account or through a one-time donation. The links are in the description below. Thank you.